In the last few months, several telescopes released some of the most incredible images of very famous nebula. Nebula like the one you see right here, Cassiopeia A, and this one, the famous Crab Nebula. With these new images showing us a lot of new things we've never seen before, but also some things that are kind of mind-blowing. For example, we actually now have a time lapse lasting for approximately 20 years, showing us how all of this changed over time and how some of these nebula transformed, even though from a distance they do appear pretty still. But I guess more importantly, the three objects we're discussing today are what's known as the supernova remnants, and all three were formed in very similar conditions, but at extremely different time frames. One of them is very young, one of them is somewhat in the middle, and one is really old. But all three are super famous and very well known, and though we've discussed them before, we now get these incredible images that show them in a completely different light. And so, how wonderful person, this is Anton. Today we're going to discuss the Crab Nebula, the Vela Nebula, and the Cassiopeia A. Basically, some of the most well-known objects in the entire galaxy, and the objects that, despite being somewhat similar, are actually very, very different. With the only thing that's basically common being their origin. They're all the result of a relatively similar star going supernova, and here we're talking about a star that's about 8 to maybe 20 times the mass of the Sun, and a star that then left behind some kind of a remnant in the middle. We saw these images even showing us this remnant. For example, here's one inside the Crab Nebula. But I guess more importantly, because these images were taken by different telescopes, we actually get to see completely different things in separate images. But I think one of the most impressive images or technically videos is this. The time-lapse taken by the Chandra telescope showing us the changes in time with this time-lapse lasting for approximately two decades visible in the X-rays and basically around the central structure, also referred to as the Pulsar Wind Nebula. Or basically the nebula inside the nebula, which is very often formed by pulsars interacting with the gas around them. And so I guess let's start with Crab Nebula. Probably one of the most famous objects in the galaxy, discovered by William Parsons back in the 19th century, who for some reason in his telescope believed that it kind of resembled a crab. And so he basically referred to this as the Crab Nebula. And here's one of the older images from 2005, taken by the Hubble telescope. Now, I don't really see the crab, but it definitely looks impressive. And today we know exactly when this object formed, based on the observations from various ancient astronomers. It seems to have appeared in the night skies on July 4th of 1054, almost a thousand years ago. And even though the nebula is about 6500 light years away from us, the light from this nebula was bright enough to be seen in bright daylight, but it basically resembled a kind of a new star, because it was obviously still far away. Here's roughly what all of this looks like if you were to combine all of the frequencies of light into one image. And so during these thousand years, the structure has expanded to be about 10 light years across, and is actually still bright enough that it can technically be seen even by using binoculars. And though the images from Hubble only showed us visible light, the new images by James Webb now revealed infrared. And this actually looks entirely different. As a matter of fact, this image taken a few months ago does not show us the shock waves and the hot gas visible by Hubble, but instead shows us cold dust, especially carbon molecules, various types of silicates, with this very strange ghostly glow or I guess milky glow, formed by various trapped electrons moving super fast around the nebula because of super powerful magnetic fields around the pulsar. And that's really the important part here. Right in the center, you actually do get to see the pulsar. And though it might be difficult to see at first, it does become a lot easier to see in the X-rays. And so because we see a pulsar, we can only assume that the original star, the progenitor star, was probably up to 20 solar masses, but that actually creates a bit of a problem. There are no 20 solar masses of gas in here. The neutron star is just under 2 solar masses, the nebula is about 5 solar masses, and so there's about 10 solar masses of stuff missing. It's assumed that maybe it's just invisible to us because it's some other dust particles or something else, but it's basically one of the modern mysteries. Where's the rest of the stuff? Nevertheless, James Webb definitely revealed a lot of details. For example, all of this reddish-orange stuff is ionized sulfur, whereas the blue stuff 
is ionized iron, with a lot of other dust, including various carbon molecules, appearing as greenish-yellow. But it's of course the pulsar nebula that produces all of these unusual tendril shapes, making it appear as some kind of an unusual space creature. And so basically everything here is sort of formed by this. This tiny tiny dot in the middle is the reason for all of these unusual shapes. But here all of this becomes even more intriguing once you start comparing this to similar objects formed much earlier or much later. Let's actually take a look at one of the oldest similar objects in the entire galaxy, the Vela Pulsar. Interestingly, the pulsar that also produces an extremely similar formation, once again seen by Chandra. But Vela Pulsar is also one of the most powerful objects in the entire galaxy. It's even able to produce gamma rays, as seen in the observations right here. But it also appears much brighter because of the distance. It's only 800 light years away from us, and so it obviously appears a little bit lighter. And so here, very recent observations by the Dark Energy Survey, using some of the most powerful cameras we have on the planet, the researchers revealed some of the most detailed pictures of this whole region. Here's a very slow zoom showing us where the supernova remnant is located. And interestingly, this is also one of the oldest such objects in the galaxy. It was very likely produced 11 to 12,000 years ago, making this object at least 10 times older than the Crab Pulsar. Yet surprisingly, it's much brighter and much more powerful. As a matter of fact, this is believed to be the most powerful pulsar in the entire galaxy. It spins approximately 11 times per second, and the remnants from the explosion are still traveling really fast, approximately 1200 kilometers per second away from the center. And so as a result, it formed this huge structure, approximately 100 light years across, or once again about 10 times larger than the Crab Nebula, and in essence it shows us the kind of a end process for most of these supernova remnants as all of this material blown away by the supernova disperses into interstellar space, mixing with all of the gas that's eventually going to become new stars and new planets. But what we're seeing here are of course the shockwave collisions with a lot of interstellar gas, which then forms all sorts of filaments visible in this image. Here is the annotated version showing us the biggest shockwave, but also the Vela Pulsar barely visible right there. With this image also showing us a wide variety of different elements, mostly ionized, and basically produced by the supernova. Here we see calcium, carbon, copper, magnesium, nickel, oxygen, silicon, and even things like krypton and germanium. All of them detected in that one single image. And so in essence, this is what most supernova usually end up as. The shockwave eventually mixes with all of the gas in the galaxy, leaving behind some kind of a lonely remnant, like the Vela Pulsar, that's surprisingly still going strong even after 12,000 years. And so here it's, I guess, worth comparing how the gas transitioned in these thousands of years from what we saw in the Crab Nebula, where things are still much more compact and are still controlled by the Pulsar Nebula itself, compared to what we see right here, where the shockwave is now mostly interacting with the interstellar gas, and the pulsar no longer has any effects. But naturally, it's also worth taking a look at something even younger, and it just so happens that James Webb took pictures of that as well, with Chandra even adding its own images, producing time lapses. This is the famous Cassiopeia A, and this beautiful X-ray time lapse in essence shows us how this changed in approximately two decades. And Cassiopeia A is essentially the most recent addition to the Milky Way galaxy very likely formed by a somewhat similar star to the one that formed Vela and Crab, but in this case back in 1670s, so approximately 350 years ago. And though this object is about 11,000 light years away from us, it's one of the most well-known and one of the most studied such objects, just because this shows us basically the beginning of the supernova remnant. But surprisingly, unlike Crab and unlike Vela, there is no pulsar. Researchers believe there is a neutron star here, but for some reason it never became a pulsar, or maybe never became yet. So this is actually one of the mysteries here. Why is this not a pulsar, whereas the much older supernova remnants all have a pulsar in the center? In case you're wondering, the main difference between a neutron star and a pulsar is that the pulsar emits pulsations, allowing us to see them from really far away. Neutron stars, on the other hand, are believed to be basically similar but just quiet and with possibly much milder effects. And this object is also much, much smaller. 
It's a lot more compact, even though it does possess these similar tendrils, with this explosion potentially even being much more powerful, because it's actually relatively similar in size to the Crab Nebula, which is older, with the material here moving really fast, up to 14,000 km per second, while also forming a lot of filaments basically resembling broken glass, possibly highlighting how extremely powerful all of this was. With these new images also showing us a few unexpected features, like the strange blob in the bottom right. The researchers are now calling this Baby Cassiopeia A, and though it might look like part of the nebula, it's actually not. This is just a reflection, or technically a light echo, produced by the light from the supernova, hitting a very distant clump of dust that was probably there even before. But more importantly, once again the images from the James Webb reveal a lot of different elements. Sulfur, oxygen, argon, which is what all of this is made from. And once again, a lot of this milky stuff, or this white stuff, this is electrons moving at very high velocities as a result of the magnetic field. Something that looks even more incredible if you look at this from a distance, with obviously different colors being produced by different elements. But in that sense, it's not so different from the previous supernova remnants, because the elements seem to be relatively similar. Which basically shows us how these objects evolve over thousands of years. With these beautiful detailed pictures, now taking us a little bit closer in helping us understand how these objects evolve. But it's really these X-ray time lapses that, to me at least, seem to be absolutely mind-blowing. One showing us how the pulsar wind nebula changes over time, highlighting the extreme power of these very dense objects, with the other one showing us how the Cassiopeia A changed as well, visibly expanding over time even though it's already 10 light years across, which once again highlights how powerful this explosion was, and how even today the material here moves really fast. 6 to 14,000 km per second. But because these are relatively recent images and we don't actually have any studies about them yet, chances are that in the next few months we'll be hearing more about the actual discoveries and possibly even more explanations on supernova remnants and how they transform galaxies over time. Because surprisingly, even though all three of these objects were formed by similar phenomena, they don't really look same at all. And that's probably because of the age difference. And so we'll definitely come back and talk more about this once there are some updates or something else is discovered about these objects in some of the future studies. Until then, check out the links in the description to learn more about these objects. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow and as always, bye bye.